Hello, may I have your attention? Thank you. Um, so, first I want to thank you. There seems to be an echo there. I want to thank you all for coming to this uh, very special event at the ILR School. Um, this is a lecture, a distinguished lecture, in honor of Alice Hansen Cook. And um, we, um, we've been running this distinguished lecture for over 10 years now. And my name is Rose Bott. I'm a faculty member at ILR. Um, and I want to introduce to you Leticia Saucedo, who's a professor of law and a distinguished expert in immigration, labor, and employment law. Um, I want to first recognize some co-sponsors of this event because that's been very, very helpful. Uh, we have the Africana Studies Center, the Center for um, the Study of Inequality, the Cornell Farm Workers Program, the Cornell Law School, the Feminist Gender and so Sexuality Studies Program, and the Institute for Social Sciences. So as you can see, this is a really important topic that we're addressing today and the uh, organizational support has really been terrific. So I want to thank those organizations. Before I turn to Leticia, I want to talk to you a little bit about Alice Cook, who many of you don't know. Um, she was a faculty member at the ILR School for many, many years. She died in 1999. And so m some faculty member knew her um, but many people do not, and she left quite a legacy. Uh, so here is her book, which is called A Lifetime of Labor, um, and she literally um, completed that. She lived throughout the 20th century, from 1905 to 1999. And in her autobiography, uh, she highlights some amazing things she did in her life. So just a few. In 1919, when she was 14, she marched in front of the White House with her mother for the women's right to vote. Um, in the early 30s, she went to study um, labor education in Germany in what was the Weimar Republic at the time, a very progressive part uh, in, of Germany at the time. And subsequently, of course, uh, the Nazis came in and she had to leave. She spent the 1930s uh, organizing labor for the CIO, which was the progressive side of the labor movement. In the 1940s, after World War II, she was asked by the army to go back to Germany and to work with the German labor movement to do adult education and leadership training, and she did that for many years. In 1945, she was asked to come to Cornell when they were first starting the ILR school, and she was among those forming the curriculum that would eventually lead to our undergraduate program. And then, in 1952, she was hired um, by the ILR school, and she worked, as uh, she did research, she did labor uh, union training throughout the state. She did that for 20 years, um, and then in 19... Seven, oh, oh, in that time, she um, broke the gender barrier in the faculty club because they would not let women into the Statler, uh, into the male faculty club. Um, and then after 1972, when she retired, she spent 25 years doing research and writing and going around the world uh, doing research on women and work, on work and family, on yeah, women's equal pay on women in unions, um, and she developed a following around the world that um, continues to this day. So that's why we uh, think she's very special. Um, and I now want to uh, talk about an announcement we're making this year, which is that um, we now have a second endowed chair in honor of a, a woman faculty member at, at Cornell. And her name is Lois Gray. And um, she came to the ILR school in 1946. And she's been working for the ILR school for 70 years. And she goes into the office in Manhattan every day. And she continues to do her work on research on women and work, on women in unions, and uh, social justice. And so she's here today. And we're going to honor her by now renaming the Distinguished Lecture in honor of Alice Cook and Lois Gray. Thank you. 
No, come on, you, you can stand up, Lois. This is a surprise for Lois. So now let me turn to Leticia uh, Saucedo, who, um, as I said, was a is a professor of law at uh, UC Davis. Um, she graduated from Bryn Mawr in um, uh, cum laude in 1984. And what I didn't know in her official biography, which she told me today, is she spent several years as a union and community activist. She first went to Philadelphia, where she worked in a neighborhood, and she'll talk about this, that um, Alice worked in um, many years before. She went to North Carolina and worked in, um, with community and labor organizations around uh, preventing financial deregulation. And then she went to Boston and she um, did organizing in, with the Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union. So she has had a long tradition of working with uh, labor and community organizations. Then she went to law school at Harvard. She was the managing editor of the Latino Law Review. Uh, she was the president of the Latino Students or Association and a member of a labor uh, law project. Um, and then she uh, left and became, she got a fellowship with the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And then subsequently she was a staff attorney for that organization for four or five years in Texas doing litigation on employment and education. Then she finally turned to becoming a, a law professor. Um, at uh, Duke and then uh, University of Nevada and now finally at Davis. Um, she's an accomplished, accomplished uh, uh, legal scholar and what is most uh, impressive about her is that she parallels, her work parallels what we do at the ILR school which is interdisciplinary research. So she has worked um, in numerous projects with sociologists and with labor scholars and with others to do an interdisciplinary approach to understanding the problems of immigrant workers. And her work covers the kind of lived experience of immigrants. Um, it, it covers um, gender and cultural dynamics within the immigrant communities and what that means, uh, discrimination at work, uh, the multiple ways and the challenges to organizing, um, and finally the kinds of um, broad strategies uh, to solving these problems that go beyond uh, the, the kind of narrow legalistic approach. So I want to welcome her and I hope you do. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all, can you hear me? Thank you so much. I wanna thank the organizers of this event um, and the Institute for Labor Relations at Cornell for um, having me here and for all the wonderful people who have uh, provided such great hospitality during my stay here. Um, and to Rose Bat for uh, being the organizer of this every year um, and for bringing me here. I'm really honored to be here as the Alice um, Cook lecturer. Um, when I agreed to do this lecture back in the fall, um, Rose Bat sent me a copy of Alice Cook's autobiography. And I uh, picked it up and read it and immediately found all kinds of connections that I had with Alice Cook. So I feel a real kinship um, with her um, and I'm so happy that I was able to um, connect with her work um, and connect with her. Um, for starters, she was, she was a teacher at the Bryn Mawr Summer School for um, uh, Working Women, which is an adult education, worker education uh, program at Bryn Mawr. Um, and uh, bringing, to, bringing into Bryn Mawr, which if you don't know Bryn Mawr College, it's a very, I don't know, high-end, Tony, uh, private institution, uh, mostly for uh, people who are of upper middle class and uh, middle class. Um, and um, so she organized a, a worker education uh, program there, taught in the worker education program um, for working women. Um, and so I actually felt that uh, spirit when I ended up at Bryn Mawr College decades later as this unsophisticated, untraveled, uh, young uh, undergrad. Um, and she also was an organizer in the Kensington section of Philadelphia 
um, at, which at the time had a very vibrant labor movement, um, was a textile a, a mill, um, and, uh, or a lot of textile mills actually. Um, and I ended up as an organizer there two decades later at a time when the textile mills had already been closed. And I didn't really have a sense of the history of uh, Kensington until I read this book. And I ended up working with the multiracial organization, uh, Black, Latino, and Polish, uh, trying to revive uh, the very neighborhood that Alice Cook had worked in um, decades before. So I'm happy that this talk actually gives me the opportunity to connect with her, and I feel a real kinship. Um, so thank you for, um, for allowing me this opportunity. So today I'm here in part because um, I've spent most of my life in academia trying to figure out how to convince our society that we need to protect immigrant workers more effectively. Um, and so the question is, do we treat them as immigrant workers? Do we treat them simply as workers um, and provide uh, the same protections that we provide all workers? Um, or do we uh, provide more protections based on their vulnerability as immigrant workers? And I've proposed solutions based on all of these um, constructions of immigrants in the workplace at one time or another. Uh, but today I want to focus on what happens when we fail to crack that nut, right? When, what happens when we fail to protect immigrant workers? How those empl employment structures get created around vulnerability in the immigrant workplace? And then predict to, into the future what's happening in our gig economy today. And by gig economy, I mean um, platforms like Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, the TaskRabbit, you know, all of these platforms that are now turning up um, in our lives today where we can just push a button and all of a sudden somebody shows up to uh, work for us. Um, so I want to focus my talk on the parallels um, between the work arrangements in the immigrant workplaces that have always been at the margins of the brick and mortar economy um, and the work arrangements that we see developing at the center of the gig economy. And I understand that the gig economy today is small, but it's the fastest growing part of our economy today. And if we continue to incorporate workers into the gig economy without changing the ways that employment laws protect the most vulnerable, then it has consequences for the future of all of our work. Um, and I imagine that my predictions about the future of work might be the, the similar ones to the ones that Alice Cook was having with her colleagues before the New Deal reforms yielded general employment protections. Today, the discussions in employment law circles center on whether and how we should identify regulations for hybrid workers, um, those who are neither employees nor independent contractors. And they have all kinds of names in the gig economy the independent worker, the micropreneur, the permatemp, the permalancer, the solopreneur. Um, all of these are examples of um, what we call workers in this platform economy. But really what I want to do is shift our focus back to what I call the dependent worker. And that's the most vulnerable worker in today's economy, whether it's in the brick and mortar economy or the gig economy. Um, and unless we do that, I think we're going to continue to slide into a world where employment laws are less and less relevant. And dependent workers, as I define them, are dependent because there's some force outside of employment law that renders them vulnerable when they move into the workplace. So in my time today, I want to talk a little bit about the dependent worker, discuss some of the patterns that create the environment for the dependent worker, um, and, and then talk about how those uh, structures are now uh, reflected in the gig economy. And then I want to offer some prescriptions that we might think about as we consider uh, what sorts of protections we need for workers in the gig economy. Um, I also have, uh, there will be a commercial break during this uh, presentation if I can get the uh, video to work uh, when, when it's time for it. So let's start with the dependent worker. We've assumed too much about the free status of workers, um, and we've overlooked the structural impediments to full citizenship that follow some workers um, into the workplace. And we live by this narrative that workers exercise full citizenship rights um, when they enter, right? They are not hindered by legal impediments when they start work, when they create contracts um, for uh, employment, that they're free to enter and exit the labor market as they see fit. And the citizenship rights of the employee entering into these work arrangements, they're a given. They're static. They don't change. They're of the same degree in nature across the board. Identity as a, as a worker is not hindered by other forms of identity in the popular um, consciousness about what an employee is. But in fact, 
the social, political, economic, and most importantly, legal constraints on a person seeking work actually play a large role in the workplace. So what happens when a worker doesn't enjoy full citizenship rights in society? So the most obvious form of full citizenship rights is citizenship status, right? So I'm focusing on immigrant workers and asking what happens when a worker lacks full citizenship status in the workplace. Um, that, to me, is what makes the dependent worker. And they're labeled as illegitimate in some aspect of their lives outside of the workplace. Um, and there's various reasons why, uh, in our public psyche, they're not considered legitimate. And we are reminded of these forms of illegitimacy regularly. So take the Trump executive orders, for example. Um, the, there's several. <laughs> Uh, the one I want to talk about is the, the Trump um, Interior Enforcement Orders. And they direct the Department of Homes, Homeland Security to target for removal those individuals who have been convicted of a crime, who have been charged with a crime, or who are suspected of committing a crime. And so it expands exponentially what we consider the universe of quote unquote criminal aliens, which have always been the target even under the Obama administration of deportation efforts. Um, and so once you expand beyond what we consider due process rights, now you have a derogation of due process rights in the um, implementation of this order. So who is affected by this, right? It, at the same time, it deprioritizes all of the uh, prior priorities that the Obama administration had had. So now you can see how people start to fear um, the uh, deportation uh, scheme because it covers everybody. If you're suspected of committing a crime, you are now uh, covered uh, by the deportation order. So who's affected? Um, national origin plays a big deal. Um, in plays a big role in deportation, right? So it's Mexicans um, whom Trump during his campaign referred to as criminals, drug cartels, and rapists, right? And what we're seeing is that it's Mexicans who then get targeted by these uh, deportation orders. And the, the, the important thing about the orders um, is not um, whether they're illegal, but that they create this cloak of Ill illegitimacy. And that's what's following people into the, uh, work, into the workplace. They're an example of how the narrative of keeping out foreigners provides a strong impetus for declaring clearly unconstitutional barriers based on um, uh, religion um, with respect to the Muslim ban and national origin with respect to these interior enforcement orders. Um, and here's the key. Even if the courts and the rule of law prevail, and the impetus to target for, the, that impetus to target foreigners remains. And these practices become institutionalized even when we find other reasons to replace the clearly discriminatory reasons for we, why we want to deport people. So we're going to continue to see vestiges of the order, even if the order is declared uh, unconstitutional, um, that target this other. Um, and they become institutionalized because we find ways to justify them like safety and security. So it's no longer we're going to target Mexicans, we're going to target people who uh, you know, create a, a security threat. Um, so it's the institutionalization along with these new rationalizations that become dangerous uh, because they can be so easily separated from their discriminatory roots. So employment laws have not made room for these illegitimate workers. And they've not even considered that these workers exist. Instead, they treat the willing subordination of employees to employers as being of the same quality and degree across the board. In addition, these laws um, have carved out exceptions. Um, so you're not an employee if you're an independent contractor or if you're working for a third party contractor. Um, and what's even more dangerous is that the structures that employers have established to distance themselves from employment relationships have been incubated in these um, uh, immigrant workplaces, right, it, where, they're, where people are illegitimate um, or they're dependent. So what patterns make for the dependent workforce um, in, the, in, the, in the workplace? Um, first, there's external laws that regulate the conduct of the vulnerable worker in their identity outside the workplace. So obviously, the, law, the external law that affects immigrants is immigration law. And it makes a non-citizen undocumented 
if she doesn't fit into any legal category of immigrant status. And it also carries, it also creates categories of exclusion and deportability. And the penalties for, for being found undocumented in the United States um, are uh, immigration related um, penalties. And it makes it really difficult to return to the United States after those penalties have been imposed. So the real consequences for workers are in immigration law, not so much in employment law, but they create conditions of inequality in the workplace nonetheless. Um, the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act did a lot to create this um, confusion about immigrant rights in the workplace. So that's the law that created employer sanctions and penalties on employers for hiring undocumented workers. And employers have never really liked this law um, and because it puts them on the hook for violating the law. Um, so uh, they have lobbied very heavily to decrease the sanctions against employers and have in essence created an ineffective law. And the result of that ineffective law is that now instead of deterring employers from hiring immigrant workers, uh, it's targeting um, uh, workers themselves. So today what we're seeing is the return of uh, raids um, in the workplace, not to um, charge employers with violating the law, but to target immigrants who don't have documented status. So second, uh, there's an impact that those external laws have on the decisions that workers make in the workplace. So because working is illegal for them, undocumented workers fear protesting low wages, protesting bad conditions, they fear rocking the boat because the consequence of getting fired again is deportation, not so much losing a job. But that doesn't leave undocumented workers completely without power. Um, it's their, their power is channeled or their agency is channeled differently. So in my own research, um, I've spent a lot of time uh, interviewing construction workers, um, mostly undocumented construction workers in the residential industry. Um, and what I have found is that workers respond to their unequal treatment um, by creating narratives that uh, counteract their vulnerability. And these narratives are both what keeps them in the job that, that's exploitative and what makes jobs valuable when jobs no longer have value. And these narratives focus on traits like um, that immigrants uh, have outside the workplace. They're breadwinners, they have an entrepreneurial spirit, they're risk takers, they're persistent. And my favorite of these narratives comes from the stories of risk taking and persistence as they attempt to cross the border. So the overarching narrative there includes overcoming fear, overcoming danger, physical terrain, and border patrol security to finally cross the border. Those stories are then turned into rationales for why they tolerate dangerous conditions in the workplace. In the workplace. As in, I risk so much to get here, I sacrificed so much to be here. I endured so much. I tried so many times to get here that I can handle all the hard work that they're going to give me in the job. There's, that's nothing compared to what I've already been through. So these narratives, they're actually narratives mostly by, from male workers um, that serve to counteract popular images of immigrant workers as cheaters, as stealing American jobs, as lawbreakers. And they also support the narratives of employers who see them as subservient, complacent, and innately physical to do the work that they're doing. And they also create a positive identity to counteract the anti-immigrant rhetoric. Now as an aside, we also interviewed women during this, um, this research, and we found that they don't engage in the same sorts of narratives. Their narratives are much more, their response is much more around figuring out how to organize in response to these difficult conditions. Um, so that was an interesting part of our research, right, that the, ma the male narratives are very much masculinity-based and the female narratives are very much about trying to figure out how the group uh, can respond in a collective way. So third, the narratives explaining the note, the, these motives turn immigrant workers into the objects of employer preferences. So this is also part of my research, how do, res how do employers um, respond um, to workers who are the hard, the hard workers, right? The ones who aren't going to complain, they're not going to rock the boat, they're going to just come in and do the work. Um, so again, the vulnerability that comes from laws and systems outside the workplace get turned into this preference for the hardworking, complacent, subservient, um, you know, uh, worker, right? The one who really is here to do the job. 
Um, and so workers are acting, on the one hand, in ways that reinforce their vulnerability, and at the same time in uh, generating these employer preferences. And now it's become a cultural preference, so ingrained in the way that, that we think that it shows up in cultural media um, and in cultural memes. Um, I'm going to try to show you this uh, video. Did you figure out how to get it back up? This is where our commercial break comes in. Um, how many of you watched the Super Bowl? Yeah, some people. <laughs> um, I don't even know who played. I don't remember anymore who played in the Super Bowl. Um, but there was this controversial ad that was played during the Super Bowl. And um, Fox, uh, Fox was the, the host for the Super Bowl. Um, decided that it didn't want to play the whole ad. I'm going to play the whole ad for you. Um, so can you press that one? Yes. So Fox only played, I think, 30 seconds of it. Thank you. 
be crying yet. <laughs> All right, so the, the, the tagline at the end says, the will to succeed is always welcome here. And the, the, to me, the, the commercial demonstrates this preference for the immigrant worker that I'm describing here. And it's so ingrained now in our culture, um, and it shows up in, in um, cultural media and in memes now. So many people saw that commercial and thought it was a political statement against the Trump administration, and maybe it was. Um, but what struck me about it was the normalization of this hardworking, enduring, persistent um, immigrant that employers desire for their workplaces. And it's not that wanting it is a bad thing, but its normalization hides the fact that employer preference for immigrant workers comes from a vulnerability that immigration law creates. So, one quick aside about the narratives, because they turn out to be really important. There's parallel nar narratives in the gig economy, right, about the entrepreneurial sp spirit, the flexibility, allowing for more family time and stronger family structures. And I'll make connections later in my talk, but I just want to uh, bring it up and make the, that quick connection here. So fourth, there's a, the, so now I've shown you the vulnerability, what happens to workers, how they respond to that vulnerability, how employers respond to the, the vulnerability. And then fourth is the proliferation of these employment structures that reflect the vulnerability of dependent workers. So because employers sense vulnerabilities in the workforce, these work arrangements are not as favorable as the ones that you would see in unionized workplaces, for example. Um, and they're, those that are overrepresented by immigrants tend to be also the ones that have independent contractor arrangements, contingent arrangements, third party contract arrangements, and even day labor arrangements. And these workplaces also tend to be segregated by race or national origin. So these independent contractor arrangements are also, based on my research, what we see when they occur as industries begin to transform. And I saw it in the residential construction industry when that industry started to, to turn to immigrant workers as the center of its labor force, um, whereas the commercial construction industry still has immigrant workers at its, at its margins. So you can start to see the, the, that transformation happening um, with, through the independent contractor structure. Fifth, there's a lack of accountability by employers who are responsible only to employees, right? So if you have a bunch of independent contractors, then you're not, you're not subject to employment law. And because the tests for employee and independent contractor, for those of you who know the control test in employment law, um, they roughly describe an on and off switch. So you're either an employee or an independent contractor and really nothing in between. Um, so this absolute view fails to account for the ways in which the social, political, and legal constraints affect the formation of the employment relationship in the first place. So ultimately, this example of the immigrant worker in the immigrant workplace gives us a preview of the employment relationship and what it might default to in the absence of intervention, um, either on a state or a federal level. So the same sorts of structures that we see in the immigrant workplace are now existing in the gig economy. Um, and the prescriptions for this new type of work relationship um, should, I think, target the vulnerabilities that gave rise to this new normal. And we, can, we have two paths, really. We can raise the protection so that all workers are protected to the same level as the dependent worker, or we can acknowledge that there's a given category of workers who's always going to be vulnerable, and we can provide those protections accordingly. Um, I'm actually agnostic about which path makes most sense, although I recognize that a rising tide lifts all boats, um, and that makes for a greater possibility for solidarity. So now I want to move to the gig economy and um, before I share the uh, parallels, I just want to talk about how we got to the gig economy in the first place. So simply put, the gig economy works because of our great economic downturn um, in the late 2000s. And that created the conditions um, not that, that made the, that the gig economy not just palatable, but um, something we should all embrace fully, right? So the idea is that we have to move from a me generation to a we generation, and that means we have to uh, embrace the notion of collaborative consumption. Um, and that's the idea that we move from individualism to an economy that's based on sharing everything that we own. So the gig and the sharing economies allow us to do so more efficiently and successfully. And the notion of collaborative consumption allows us to split up ownership into smaller and smaller pieces so that we consider everything in our world part of a shared experience. And that includes the labor that goes into creating the shared experience. 
Okay, so that's the narrative, right? Here's what's missing from the narrative, and that's that the huge downward turn in our economy resulted in the massive firing of millions of workers with no options but to turn to this new and evolving form of um, doing business to earn a living, right? And that's the part that people don't really talk about. Um, and these individuals themselves accepted the narratives that undergird the sharing economy because really they had no choice. Um, and the whole of the private workforce, in other words, is becoming both vulnerable and the excess labor that makes the gig economy's narrative work. So author Stephen Hill has noted, in the aftermath of the Great Recession of 2008, both the right and the left agree at least on one thing. The American workforce has become more vulnerable. Wages are lower, workers have less security, and the safety net is disappearing. Moreover, he notes, companies today want a workforce that they can switch on and off as needed. And then he talks about what it looks like to be a, a 1099 worker, because he was a 1099 worker, right? Now you're responsible for all of your own uh, benefits, for your own pension plan, for um, Social Security payroll tax, for Medicare, and he goes on and on, right? The, uh, the notion being that we are now in a situation in which really we're working on a, on a piece rate basis. And the only time that we get paid is when we're doing actual uh, uh, work. So these are the work arrangements that employers are replicating for the broader population. Um, and again, they were previously reserved for immigrant uh, workplaces or people who are at a structural disadvantage in the regular economy. So in the gig economy, um, the, it's the lack of laws and systems for defining work arrangements that place all workers at a disadvantage, and it places de dependent workers at the greatest degree of disadvantage. And they've, again, avoided responsibility because of um, uh, independent contractor or intermediary or third-party contracting arrangements. So, and it's grown tremendously in the last, since 2009, um, this form of labor has grown over 40%. Um, and um, these staffing firms, um, these third-party contractors, basically are creating triangulated relationships between workers, intermediaries, and end-user businesses. And the thing that the gig economy adds is then the end-user consumer, right? So now there are, it's more and more of a, a distance created between the employer and the employee. Um, so um, the online platform is really the perfect vehicle to both promote and perpetuate this narrative, right? That people want flexibility, they want to reap the rewards of self-employment, um, they want uh, um, to follow their dreams, to do what they've never been able to do, not to have a boss, um, all of those are the same sorts of narratives we used to hear um, from workers in the uh, immigrant workplace. And of course, for uh, companies like Uber, the um, benefits are great. So Uber saves up to 30% in payroll taxes by not classifying its workers as employees. Um, and again, they're only paying for the limited amount of time that they're working. So here are the parallels, the, the, the true parallels that I see between immigrant workplaces and the emerging gig economy. First, um, the legal structure um, in the workplace makes for vulnerable workers, outside the workplace makes for vulnerable workers inside the workplace. Um, and here it's the lack of legislation really to create safety nets um, for people in general um, that has created a whole class of vulnerable individuals outside the workplace. Um, second, employers create work structures that reflect the vulnerability in the workplace. Um, third, workers in the gig economy create these narratives of self-sufficiency and entrepreneurship to explain their choice to enter the gig economy. Um, fourth, employers seek workers who buy into these narratives. And fifth, employers disclaim responsibility for gig workers because they're not employees. And so. Um, there are also elements that harken back to immigrant workplaces, like the use of networks to create ready sources of labor. That's just like ne network hiring in immigrant workplaces. Um, the use of intermediaries to bring together the consumer with the service provider. That's just like labor contracting in farm work. Um, the use of algorithms to bring consumers and service providers together. That's like labor supply networks. Um, the use of vulnerable workers who had little choice but to uh, uh, accept the work arrangements offered by the employer. 
um, and the use of psychological levers to keep uh, workers on the job. So in the immigrant workplace, it's immigration law, as I said. Um, now what we're finding out is that in the gig economy, it's behavioral um, psychology, right? That uh, folks are reporting in Uber, for example, that um, they're, that Uber is using gaming technology to make sure that drivers don't quit working after they're done. They think they're done for uh, the day. And then finally, the use of piece rate wage systems that pay workers only for the work that they do. So why do I focus on the gig economy and what's its relationship with immigrant workers? So as I said earlier, without strong intervention from employment law of the sort that Alice Cook was involved in during the New Deal, I think we're going to see employment law become less relevant. Um, and this is important in and of itself because uh, the protections and the safety net for workers are eroding. And second, indications are that the gig economy is the next labor market for immigrant workers, for underrepresented minorities, and for poor workers. So recently, the Pew Research Center um, uh, put out a study that showed that for the labor platform part of the gig economy, so there's two sort of platforms. There's the asset platform and the labor platform. The labor platform is people who are putting out their, their services for hire. The asset platform is Airbnb. People are putting up their houses for um, rent. So in the labor platform part of the economy, the Uber, the Lyft, the TaskRabbit, um, Participation is more common among blacks and Latinos than among whites. It's more common among those with relatively low household incomes. Um, and it's more common among young adults than any other age group. And these are not casual users. 60% of the labor platform users say that their money, the money that they earn from these sites is essential or important to their overall financial situations. And workers who describe the income they earn from these platforms are more likely to come from low-income households to be non-white and not to have attended college. And they're more likely to gravitate towards the physical tasks like ride hailing, air cleaning, or laundry. And they're also significantly more likely to say that they're motivated to do this work because they need to be able to control their own schedule, and more importantly, because there's not any other jobs available for them um, where they live. So now I want to talk a little bit about prescriptions. Um, because, and, I, and in general, I think they require that employment law take account of these external uh, systems that make workers uh, vulnerable. So first, um, several scholars have argued that labor contractor type regulation um, needs to be uh, included in any kind of employment law reform, reform that holds platform firms accountable as joint employers. Um, so it, it's reminiscent, actually, of calls to strengthen joint employer doctrines and employment statutes now. Um, and all of those arose out of low-wage workplace um, exploitation in industries like um, sweatshops, garment work, construction, um, taxi industry, home care, and food delivery. In all of these businesses, the lead firm utilizes work structures that include sub subcontracting, independent contracting, and third-party contracting. Second, I think employment laws have to make up for the, in protection for any deficits in power that arise out of the relationship, whether it's an independent contractor or an employee relationship. So importantly, this means I think we need to change the way that employees are defined so that they reflect more readily the changes in the employment relationship that's occurring in these developments in the gig economy. Third, I, have to, I think we have to focus anti-discrimination law on the effects of exploiting these um, uh, structural inequalities. So in the case of immigrant workers, it means that the disparate impact doct doctrine might lead to a strategy for ameliorating the effects of undocumented status if it turns out that the employer preference for undocumented workers creates a segregated Latino workforce. And in the gig economy, a similar strategy might target systematic categorization of jobs that are filled by underrepresented minorities as independent contractors. Fourth, in the age of Trump, I think we have to start to rely on creation of state protections. Um, and so these state protections have to be around uh, dependent workers um, so that we put them on the same playing field as workers who are citizens. So an example of this is in California, um, we have uh, the California legislature has implemented anti-retaliation provisions to protect workers from employers who call immigration authorities. Um, in the gig economy, um, the state is also looking at creating a state independent contractor labor relations act. 
and I know there's all kinds of issues with that and preemption and that sort of thing, but there's at least a step in the, in the direction of trying to provide uh, the type of protection that the NLRA would provide. And then it brings me to my uh, possibly most important prescription. So in the early 20th century, before the passage of the NLRA, organizations were diffuse and they were varied in their strategies and some would describe uh, chaotic, right? So the NLRA gave trade unions the chance to prosper, but it also ended the experimentation. And as the number of unionized employee, employees continues to decline, um, we have to foster experimentation and competing models again. So what better place to encourage it than in the gig economy? Um, and this has already started to work with immigrant workers. We have the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the Restaurant Opportunity Center, the Taxi Workers Alliance, the Freelancers Union, these, and similar worker centers. All are examples of this experimentation uh, with worker organization outside of the traditional union model. And they're actually all powered by the most vulnerable workers in our economy today. They're all immigrant organizations. And lastly, I think we need a new social contract. Um, so with the unraveling of the employer-employee relationship, families now face uh, the risk of downturn, downturn themselves, right? So just as with farm workers and immigrant workers in other contexts, gig workers are left out of the regulatory framework that protects employees. And we need to develop ways to overcome these obstacles. We can take a lesson from the construction industry um, that created multi-employer plans uh, that protected uh, employees even as they moved from job to job. And their money is paid into a trust to cover employee benefits and it's typically paid on an hourly basis. Already uh, general counsels of uh, uh, platform uh, organizations are trying to come up with that sort of uh, model um, because people don't work for the same platform you know, for 40 hours a week. Um, so there an employee would be able to prorate contributions depending on the time or the wage um, earned in a given week. So I'm going to stop there um, and see if you all have any questions. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts um, and for the honor of uh, letting me be the Alice Cook lecturer. Um, well, there's actually a part of the platform economy um, that uh, takes in invisible workers, right? Uh, and they get paid uh, by the task. So, for example, Amazon, right, will um, have people, and a lot of those are outside of urban areas, right? They'll have people, I don't know, uh, tag... Um, uh, tag uh, uh, pictures and that sort of thing. Google does the same thing, right? So there are um, areas of the platform economy that everyone is moving into, um, I think, including immigrants. Um, what's, in, what's interesting to me is that immigrants are actually looking for the places where they can actually insert themselves even in the platform economy. So the next time you do take Uber or Lyft or one of those, like notice who your drivers, who your drivers are. And the, their power, 
Yeah, and I actually don't think it's false consciousness because I think there's a real sense of agency in what they're doing, right? So if there isn't, uh, I wouldn't say it's uh, in a, you know, that they're, that they don't know about organizing and they don't want to organize and they're resistant to organizing. Um, I think it's more trying to make sense of their journeys as they move into uh, uh, the workplace in the United States, right? And so a part, of a, a part of the journey is the crossing of the border, but the other part is what happens when you're actually in the workplace. And I think the narratives help, uh, this is my interpretation, the narratives I think help uh, build the agency and move that sense of agency along, right? Um, for the women, at least the women that we interviewed, um, it was a small sample. Um, the other part of that is that women are, this is in construction, right? So women are also facing, at the same time they're facing exploitation by the employers, they're facing all kinds of sexism from their fellow employees, right? F fellow workers, I should say because they're all independent contractors. So there's this sense that whatever the narrative was that works for these males that we talked to was not a narrative that moved agency forward for the women that we talked to. Um, and so for that, though, they're the ones that actually moved to look for the building trades councils um, in the city. They're the ones that actually, you know, sort of took on the job of, of organizing. And I don't know enough about the labor movement, but I get the sense that it was, it was women in other industries that did the same thing, right? Um, so, and I, I, don't know if I, I don't know that I can answer where they came from. I really, the, the, the study that we did really was to try to figure out why it was, if people were not uh, grieving in the workplace, were not complaining in the workplace, um, what did they attribute it to? So it was more about their perceptions rather than where they felt like the, their narratives were coming from. Sure. So I think they, I think both the men and the women that we talked to felt like they were agents of their own destiny, right? And a very, very powerful narrative for all of them was, I don't want to be an employee. I want to be a small businessman. And the way I get to be a small businessman, the way I get to own my own business is I save up enough money to get enough tools and a truck so I can hire all these other guys, right? So there was just this sense that the, even the employees, the, the structure of employer-employee was not one that was going to move forward their, their destiny, right? They understood the limitations of it. And the way that they responded to it was by, by having these sort of narratives of, I'm a small businessman in the making. Yes. Yes. It sounds a little sort of more uh, rhythmic than we said versus trabajadores. And it was so troubling to me. It, it was a sort of nasty way to embrace this idea of the quintessential, you know, hard worker. Yes, um, don't put me in that category. Yeah. It's so problematic. Right. Um, in a way that, you know, you don't want to negate the strength behind um, the authority over being a hard worker that mm -hmm, is survived, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, good. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. I think that's right. I think historically that's right. Um, I, I guess I don't know the answer psychologically <laughs> of, of you know how they how the narratives keep replicating themselves. Yes. Okay. Thanks so much for your talk. It's really terrific. Uh, I wonder if you have some reflections on going back to the point you mentioned about the states and the mm -hmm. role of the state. Mm -hmm. idea, you know. um, <laughs> I'm I'm ready to embrace it. <laughs> the history, right? There's a history. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I've been reflecting on it a lot more lately. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, when you think about the workplace, right, it was traditionally a state power. Um, and at least in California, I think California has gone back to this place of we want to protect everybody in the workplace. So that's a, the, it, it goes back to the idea that I first talked about. Do we want to treat everybody as a worker, regardless of their immigration status? Do we want to give immigrant workers more protection? Right. So California has at least defaulted back to we want to give all of our residents the same amount of protection. Right. And if that means that we have to protect more because the um, federal government is bringing its, you know, its enforcement down uh, more, more harshly on this set of people, then that's what we're going to have to do so that everybody gets equal treatment um, in the workplace. So I see the role of the state as actually being the sort of, um, I don't know, uh, mediator, right, between the federal government and a worker who happens to be uh, an immigrant. Um, and um, sort of leveling the, the playing field at the very least. Um, I'm actually working on an article now on, we have this image that immigration law is um, almost exclusively federal uh, authority, right? Like it's, everybody knows it and everybody says it over and over again. But in fact, like if you look at immigration law, just like other sorts of federal laws, there's a lot of leeway that's given to the states. There's a lot of places where the states actually have powers, and they have powers within, uh, they've been given these powers within, uh, within um, immigration law, right? So state uh, uh, law enforcement certifications, right, come from state and local uh, governments for workplace crimes, for example. Um, state laws create criminal violations that are related to the workplace. Uh, state laws, uh, uh, the, the, the federal law gives state laws all kinds of leeway around contracting and around licensing. Um, state employment agencies are involved in, in determining whether American workers are willing, able, and available to work, right, for guest worker programs and that sort of thing, right? So there are all these places where when we start to think about where state protections might be, the federal government has already given that up. And so my, um, my reflection on that or my point um, is that we have to really look closely at where those um, state levers might be and where the federal government, because, precisely because we share sovereignty, right? The states and the federal government share sovereignty and Congress for a long time has had that sort of, uh, its own narrative about that, that it has included in federal laws all sorts of places where the state has power that the state can now, should now, um, move forward with. Yes. Thank you for coming. Um, with respect to the gig economy, I've been under the impression for a long time that in order for uh, a researcher to actually find a gig worker uh, that really talks about being their own boss and being able to support themselves, you have to go on like a Marjorie Mead style expedition. And <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. But how is it then, or, or do you actually think that the employers themselves are sort of planting this seed and that there really is no, is no evidence that these narratives are actually backed up? Um, or do you really think that they're kind of organic? No, they're not organic. <laughs> No, they're part of the narrative that came with the the, the um, platform with these apps, right? In fact, I think it was the general counsel of TaskRabbit who first turned me on to this notion of collaborative consumption and the sharing economy and how wonderful it is and we have to move away from this me generation and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I do think that it is coming from uh, the employers. Um, but this Pew Research um, Center study that I uh, talked about um, actually makes distinctions um, that I think are really important between the asset-driven uh, platform economy and the labor-driven platform economy. And I think that'll help us as researchers to start to rethink, right? We can't put them all in the same, in the same boat. And in fact, that's what TaskRabbit was trying to do. So in California, Uber uh, was challenged by workers um, who said they were employees and, you know, they won and then they lost and then they won, I think and then they settled. Um, so at that time, all of these um, platform, um, all these apps were basically saying, we're not like Uber, right? They had already thrown Uber under the bus, right? We're very different from what's all going on over that. Yeah, those are, those are misclassified uh, uh, employees, right? We're different. We're doing something completely different with, with our model, right? Our collaborative consumption sharing model. Um, so, what was interesting about the study is that it actually did separate out in a way that I think it makes it a lot easier to find the workers that we're talking about. So that you're not lumping the Airbnb second home, right, with the, the person who's making $20,000 a year working full time for Uber. It's funny that TaskRabbit, uh, if you ever talk to them, they always give you the names of the same three people. <laughs> <laughs> I think they have to, yeah, I think they have to work on that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. 